I'm taking Tony at his word that this is uh, that, that this is uh, the, the first time that this has happened. I took him at his word that uh, this was an isolated incident. Incident. Since then, there have been numerous reports of, of other incidents, uh, allegations. This was a, a shock to me when when uh, when I was made aware of the situation, um, and uh, there's no indication that this uh, sort of thing was happening. That was Andrew Shear before, then an hour later after a caucus meeting yesterday and then again today. The opposition leader has changed his response and ultimately he ousted Tony Clement from the Conservative caucus. So how does a party and its leader handle this kind of thing politically? At Issue is here to dig into that and more. Andrew Coyne is here in Toronto tonight. Althea Raj is in Ottawa and Paul Wells is also in Ottawa. Good to see everybody. Chantal is off this week. Uh, Andrew, let's start with you. Um, I, I mean, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty of, of the case and because there's more details uh, emerging. Um, but the fact that Andrew Scheer uh, first allowed Tony Clement to just remove himself from committees, got more information and then asked him to leave from caucus. What do you make of his response sort of overall? Well, I guess one thing we learned from a lot of these cases is it's unusual if it's just one time. Uh, so he may have been a bit credulous or whatever other word you want to use in taking him at his word that first time. Mm. The general with, rule with these things, I guess, is you want to get out in front of it. You want to be seen to be acting decisively. You don't want to be seen to be covering anything up or being too soft in it. Uh, in this case, there wasn't, I think, really questions of, of uh, due process involved. It was admitted that he'd been involved in what he'd been involved in. Um, so, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a messy situation for everybody. I, I think they were scrambling to try and deal with it as best they could, and perhaps they were a little slow behind the ball. Um, Althea, what, what do you think of the way Andrew Shear handled it and sort of responded to it over the past couple of days now? Uh, I'm of two minds. If you take the leader at his word, he acted decisively faced with the allegations that he thought he was facing, basically that Mr. Clement was being uh, allegedly extorted by a foreign actor who sought to take advantage of his infidelities and then dumped him as justice critic and pulled him from the National Security Committee. Um, but then if you pair that with what we're hearing now from people like Rachel Curran, uh, who was uh, Prime Minister Harper's director of policy, saying, well, these allegations about Mr. Clement were uh, you know, circulating for a long time. Well, if that's the case, um, and people in the inner circle knew about this, why would they have appointed him to the National Security Committee to begin with? Mm. Uh, that has to be one of the most important positions that a party uh, gets to, to nominate, and you want that person to be above reproach completely. So I think there are certainly po possibly questions about Mr. Shear's judgment in that regard. Um, I think the benchmark for how political leaders deal with these things um, happened not because of Me Too a year ago, but really in the way that um, Justin Trudeau, when he was leader of the Liberals, ousted uh, Scott Andrews and Massimo Bichetti. Uh, then you realize that um, there is an absolute zero tolerance, that politics is always involved, and that uh, even though the Prime Minister now has not lived up to that benchmark that he set with people like Ken Hare or Hunter Tutu, for example, there are a lot of uh, questions and a lack of transparency around the ouster of Mr. Tutu, that um, you have to take these absolutely seriously and that usually you should be investigating and that there is um, people won't trust you by mm. default and yeah. so uh, transparency is definitely something that you want to instill and when it's not there whether it's a staffer like uh, Claude Eric Gagné in the Prime Minister's office yes. or it's Darshan Khan there is an expectation that you know people at the end of the day will get some sort of an answer as to why somebody was ousted and what happened. Um, I mean you, you've given lots of different names there of incidents that have happened and they're all sort of varying degrees. I wonder mm -hmm. Paul if it was the fact that there was some sort of uh, extortion attempt, at least according to Tony Clement, uh, that that led to this. Because otherwise, it's not clear to me w what it is. It, it's just a consensual relationship, or what? What exactly is what exactly is he being thrown out of caucus for? It, it's that he had opened himself up to uh, uh, um, essentially attacks against him that uh, compromised his freedom of choice. He was being blackmailed. Yes. And the astonishing thing is that something similar had happened, according to the report in the Toronto Star, uh, several weeks before the most recent uh, um, uh, incident, and that he should, have, he, should, he should already have learned the hard way that he was opening up to this sort of, uh, of extortion. Uh, it's an extraordinary case. And 
Althea says that there's an absolute zero tolerance. I'm afraid that in some cases it looks like that's not quite true. It seems like Andrew Scheer really hoped that he wasn't going to have to punish Tony Clement too uh, harshly because Tony Clement has roots in the conservative movement that go back to the election of Mike Harris in 1995 in Ontario. He's never been one of the party's best performers, but he has been uh, well regarded um, and, and, and is essentially charitably regarded uh, by a lot of people who follow the party. And I think that slowed the leader's hand yeah. in, in meeting out appropriate punishment. And that's why this has been two or three days of awful, awful news for the Conservatives instead of just one. Yeah, and I guess that's what they probably should have avoided. Does it do any sort of lasting damage to the party, though, Andrew? Um, I don't think so. I mean, there, there have been cases on both sides of the aisle, in fact, including the case of the Prime Minister himself, who was credibly accused of groping someone has never really bothered to properly deny it. So there's all kinds of shifting standards involved here. Um, but I think as long as, as, as it's contained to this, we don't have a rash of similar cases, and I don't see any reason why we would. Uh, I don't see it being a, a huge damage to the party. Okay, I want to switch gears if I can to talk a little bit about the midterms because inevitably that has some sort of impact here that we're all trying to, to, to uh, get a sense of uh, in these early days. Here's a little bit of what Trudeau and the president said uh, just the day after. It's uh, something we look forward to working uh, with uh, the new Congress on a broad range of issues, uh, as we have in the past. And a quick question on the USMCA. Now that it's been concluded, have you repaired your relationship with Prime Minister Trudeau? Yes, I have. We have a very good relationship. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Paul, in spite of all that, uh, I don't know if the relationship is so good, but I think it's functioning. Does, does what happened on Tuesday night change anything for Canada? Do we need to change our strategy and our approach? Is it good news, bad news? Where do you sit on that? Well, the, the new Democrat-controlled House of Representatives has to decide what they think about USMACA the trade agreement and there's um, there are essentially rumors that they're not thrilled with it and might impede its uh, implementation in itself that's not a horrible thing that just means we'd be stuck with old, the old NAFTA which uh, by most accounts the Canadian government and most Canadian businesses would have preferred anyway <laughs> I mean the only thing that could happen is that if in a confrontation with the Democrats in 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 the house uh, the president decides he's going to abrogate NAFTA even in the absence of a new deal but that would be a really bad day at the office um, and, and, and probably shouldn't be counted the, the likeliest outcome. Um, objectively, the president took a setback the other night. He lost the House of, uh, the House of Representatives. He lost several governorships. It was, a, it was a medium bad night for the president. But he lives in his own head, and he thinks he uh, scored a fabulous victory and is likely to be even less uh, impeded by other people's expectations of normal behavior mm. than before. We've seen that in his treatment of the White House press corps in the last 48 hours. Well, even getting rid of Just Sessions, too. I mean, we see that oh, when that. he's uh, on defensive. <laughs> oh, that thing. <laughs> yeah, that thing. It, seem, it <laughs> seems as though this is how that he reacts to that. And I don't know if that's good news or bad news, uh, Althea, for Canada. I mean, possibly he just sort of forgets about us altogether because he's got enough going on. Uh, the president is not going to forget about <laughs> us, Maka. This is definitely something he wants to wave around. Um, it's an interesting position for uh, the Trudeau Liberals and our embassy in uh, D.C. Uh, there are a number of first-time legislators uh, in the House of Representatives that uh, I'm sure the ambassador wants to get a better sense of where they stand on ASMACA, NAFTA, NAFTA 2.0. I think um, from what I've read and people I've spoken to, nobody expects a quick vote on this. But there is a risk that um, there is no vote before we head into a federal election next year. And then I think uh, this is where uh, NAFTA 2.0 could get inserted into the, the election debate. Like, what would Andrew Scheer change about yeah. NAFTA 2.0? And so uh, there is a possibility that we keep talking about this for the months to come. How about you, Andrew? What, what do you think changes or doesn't change? Well, again, we don't know. It's going to depend on the makeup of the, the particular types of Democrats that were elected. On the whole, it looks like there were, there were more moderates than radicals elected for the Democrats. Um, if we were negotiating from scratch, there might be worrisome that, that, that they're traditional protectionist things, but it, it's, it's changing. You know, you look at mm -hmm. the public opinion polls now, Republicans, because Donald Trump's against free trade, have shifted en masse against free trade, and Democrats have kind of shifted en masse against Republicans. Mm -hmm. So there's actually some uh, free trade sentiment among Democrats and Democratic voters these days. I think what you will probably see is it'll get caught up in, in the general horse trading and log rolling that goes on in Congress all the time. And there will be conditions attached and demands attached and, um, you know, changes that will be asked for. And that will be interesting to see 
exactly how the administration responds to that. Do they cut a deal with them? Do they say, no, we've, we've got to deal with the Canadians, we can't change it? Um, so it, it adds uncertainty. It means we'll probably have to go back to lobbying the, the various Congress members uh, the way we were doing before. Uh, so it will continue that, that uncertainty. But uh, other than that, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. Uh, I'll end with you, Paul, on, on that issue. Do you think it delays the implementation of NAFTA for the reasons that Andrew put out there, that, that just it, things are just going to be harder to get them finalized? Well, and, uh, like until it's implemented, until, it's, it's, until it passes a vote in the Congress and it's implemented, it's sitting around and uh, idle hands are the devil, devil's playground. Somebody might be tempted to uh, oppose a contested amendment, just as we saw in several European legislatures, uh, with with CETA. the CETA yeah, trade, yeah. Trade, trade agreement. Good point. And so, uh, look, a, a, a quick ratification would be better, but I, well, I, I was about to say I don't see any problems arising, but it's been a lousy <laughs> year for people to make that kind of prediction, hasn't it? <laughs> Particularly with anything to do down there. <laughs> George Schultz, the former Treasury Secretary and Secretary of State, said nothing is ever settled in this town, meaning Washington. So everything is always in play, even when you think it's been, it's been uh, dealt with. So that's words to live by. All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Before we go, be sure you subscribe to the Ad Issue podcast. We've got extra content there. And this week, we're talking about politicians versus the press. We alluded to it in the main panel, but we'll dig into this latest clash of Trumps with reporters. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national.